Welcome to this episode of Healthy and Happy. I am Waveney Martinborough, your host. And our topic for today is Diabetes is a Sugar Daddy, How to Keep Him Out. And our presenter, Dr. George Guthrie. So, who is a sugar daddy? Usually it's an older man who is giving financial or other support to a younger woman in exchange for sexual favor. So Doc, why can we call type 2 diabetes a sugar daddy? <laughs> well, I suppose we could call it a sugar daddy because uh, it kind of uh, makes sweet things happen, <laughs> seems kind of nice at the beginning, but I suppose it's got a bad side too because uh, diabetes fathers children like uh, heart attacks and strokes and amputations and those types of things. Okay. I understand that over 29 million people in the United States are afflicted with diabetes. Almost one in ten. Mm -hmm. So my big question is uh, how does this disease operate? Uh, type 2 diabetes comes when there's too much energy coming in, not enough energy coming out, and the body has then too much energy inside. It develops an insulin resistance, and that insulin resistance uh, leads to an increase in insulin, and then all the diseases and problems in children tend to come out of that. Well, that's good to know. Two questions. Okay. Can type 2 diabetes be prevented? Mm -hmm. And question two, can it ever be reversed? It's helpful to understand where it comes from because if you understand the cause, then it's easier to kind of focus on how to prevent it and then maybe in many cases to actually reverse it. Okay. So uh, we've already talked about too much energy in, not enough energy out. Energy in is food, calories, energy out is exercise. So if I'm focusing on preventing, what I'd like to do is to m keep the calories coming in fairly steady and or, or decrease them a little bit and then uh, make sure there's plenty of exercise. So that's pretty well documented to help prevent type 2 diabetes. Uh, can you say a bit about sugar? A lot of people think of diabetes as being a sugar problem. It's much more about calories. A lot don't understand that too much fat or too much sugar can cause the problem. It really is uh, an excess of calories. So, hence, it is tied rather closely to obesity. I don't know whether you've heard the term, but in the medical literature we read of something called diabetes. So, <laughs> I like to say for every pound you uh, gain, you're a step closer to diabetes. And every pound you lose, you're stepping away from diabetes. Okay, so what are good sources of food that will combat the rise of diabetes? So you'd like to talk about the food part of things. Yeah. Well, <coughs> the intake part. The <laughs> intake <laughs> part, that's right. So if we uh, eat foods that are high in sugar and fat. The sugar especially tends to go into the body very quickly and this puts a strain on the system. Uh, if we take, have foods that are, uh, kind of enter slowly into the bloodstream, the body has more of a chance to adjust. And those foods are foods that are uh, high in fiber, high in water, and low in fat. Those foods are best found in the uh, uh, the produce part of the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, sometimes we divide them up. I mean, uh, those that put the energy in slowest, for example, uh, of the fruits are the northern fruits. You know, things okay. like pears and and apples and and uh, cherries and peaches and berries. Whereas southern fruit, like uh, Mangoes, mangoes and <laughs> uh, yes, one of my favorite foods as well. Mangoes and uh, uh, kind of very ripe bananas, those types of things tend to go in faster. For vegetables, we like above ground vegetables better than below ground vegetables because they have a lot of fiber, a lot of water, 
and tend to uh, let the sugars go into the body much more slowly. I have never heard the term above ground and below ground, <laughs> but it, it, it may be a helpful easy. concept. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Well, it sounds like sodas and sweet drinks are in bad company. That, that's a good point, and I'm glad that you just didn't say sodas, but it's really sodas and sweet drinks. And it's interesting that the science is telling us that that includes fruit juices as well, because, for example, a big glass of orange juice or apple juice may actually have as much sugar as a soda does. So somewhere between 8 to 12 teaspoons uh, per uh, you know, can yeah. or serving. And that adds up if people are taking a, a couple of uh, sweet drinks a day, why that's, what, 700 in a year? So it ends up being a lot of extra calories. So if one's trying to prevent or reverse type 2 diabetes, uh, minimizing or eliminating those would be a really good step. Okay, so step one, the intake. Tell us about the output. The output is, is, is exercise, right? Okay. So as we exercise, we tend to burn calories. When our muscles uh, need energy, they tend to become more insulin sensitive. The energy is taken in, and it decreases the excess calories overall and helps the whole process improve. So manage the intake, the output by exercise. Yes. Do we have a third strategy? Uh, let's see. Third strategy... Does uh, our weight have anything to do well, with Well, I, I had mentioned the weight, and, and you're right. We could actually, because of that term, diabetes, losing weight... Which is a new term. I never heard it yeah, before. Yeah, it, it, it is a bit uh, new, but I think it speaks well. Yes. Uh, bringing our weight down uh, will help reverse the process. Just You don't have to lose the weight, just being in the process of so weight managing. loss. Yeah. If it's on its way down, the health is beginning to happen in the body. The insulin resistance turns around, the insulin levels come down. One final question. Yes. Do we ever need medication? Uh, medications are uh, necessary for some patients to get their blood sugars down, but we should always focus on the cause and treat that. Thank you so much for sharing these strategies. If we follow them, we'll keep the sugar daddy out. we will be on the right path. <laughs> okay. Welcome to this episode of Healthy and Happy. I am Ravni Martin Burrow. Our topic for today, how to prevent a heart attack. And our presenter, Dr. Schubert Palmer. Each Valentine's Day, the heart takes center stage. Millions of dollars are spent on heart-shaped candy and the billions on heart-shaped jewelry. Why? Because the heart is a symbol of love. More than that, the heart is a symbol of life. So, Dr. Palmer, Tell us about the human heart, this marvelous machine. Yes, your heart is a small but incredible machine. Right now, if, if you make a fist, that's the size of your heart. It weighs around 8 to 12 ounces. It starts working. Actually, it starts to work 21 days after conception. And once you're born, on average, it beats around 72 beats per minute. And translated over a lifespan, that's two and a half billion heartbeats for the rest of your life. That's 100,000 heartbeats a day. Imagine that. And here's something else. Your body has around 5 liters of blood, and as your heart circulates every minute over a period of time, that's 10.5 pints of life-giving blood that your heart's continuously pumping. That's 2,000 gallons of blood every day throughout this maze of arteries and capillaries, which if you string them together would form around 60,000 to 100,000 miles of blood vessels. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, but you know, sometimes this marvelous machine becomes defective. So tell us a bit about heart disease. Sure. In America, heart disease is the number one killer for both men and women. Here's a model of the heart. As you can see here, there are these are uh, coronary arteries, of which we have three main ones, starting out with the left main coronary artery. One runs in the front, called the left anterior descending artery. One circles around the back side, called the circumflex. And then there's an artery on the right side, 
called the right coronary artery. Together they provide mus the, the muscles with the blood they need so that they can keep squeezing the blood to your circuit, um, to the body. What happens if you look at a close-up model is these arteries can get blocked. They start out nice and pretty, but as time goes by, depending on our lifestyle, something happens. There's a buildup of plaque until suddenly or gradually it gets to the point where the artery can be very uh, filled with these uh, plaque uh, plaques of fatty deposits, okay? And this causes the heart to narrow. So some areas of the heart will become deprived of oxygenated blood and they, they become weak and dysfunctional. CAD. How does a person move from CAD to a heart attack? Well, coronary artery disease includes heart attacks and uh, the many derivatives thereof. And um, if the blocked artery gets progressively worse or if the plaque breaks off and blocks the artery completely, then you can have uh, uh, what they call an ST elevation myocardial infarction. That's a bad one. That's not good news. That can result in death. So, if I think I am having a heart attack, what should I do? Call 911 and have someone get you to the hospital right away. Let me show you what the physician would do uh, when you have a heart attack. I'm going to deputize you to be my assistant, okay? <laughs> okay. All right, if you got onto that, here's what we will do. When you get to the hospital, we're going to take you to the operating room catheterization laboratory. Then we're going to insert this catheter uh, through your artery, either in your arm or often through the groin, either way, and uh, advance, this block, uh, uh, advance this catheter to the artery that is blocked. So you see this catheter right there at the very tip is a balloon. Once we get to the artery that is blocked, we advance it into that blocked area, and then we're going to go ahead and inflate that balloon. It has a little stent on the top of it, and watch what happens. Real fast. Okay. That's it. There you have it. And with the balloon inflated, you have now opened up the artery, and then we will deflate the balloon and go quickly. Keep going backward and keep sucking it out. And we will remove the, the balloon, and there is your stent. And this stent opens the blocked artery, and you can have the life-giving blood restored to this part of the heart, and, and that helps to limit the extent of the heart attack. But I can tell you, and I do this uh, quite often, in fact, I just had to do this again yesterday at 3 o'clock in the morning, when I should be sleeping. <laughs> anyway, uh, but here's what I do. Immediately after opening up this blocked artery, I'll go to the, uh, I take off brake scrub, take off my mask, everything else, um, my gloves and so on, walk to the head of the table and I'll talk to the patient and I t I'll tell them, I, I got good news and I got bad news. What do you want to hear first? <laughs> so I'll tell them, the, well, the good news, the artery is now open and then I tell them the bad news. We did not cure anything. What we've done is just apply the, a Band-Aid because you cannot cure heart disease by anything I do in the hospital, not any stents or any open heart surgery. So we need to focus on prevention. Absolutely. What can we do to prevent a heart attack? The first step is to do aerobic exercise. Aerobics are whole body exercises that strengthen the heart and the blood vessels. And since this type of exercise strengthens the heart, it causes it to work more efficiently and it helps to make more blood vessels to help even in the event of an accident on the freeway, you'll have enough side streets uh, from the exercise. Some examples of exercise, walking, running, cycling, swimming. Walking, I think, is the best. It's the safest, it's the simplest, and it is the it's least cheapest. expensive. <laughs> I didn't want to use the word cheap. <laughs> So my recommendation and the recommendations are uh, to walk 30 minutes a day, five days a week, and that's what I would do. In fact, the study at uh, Harvard alumni looking at 16,000 graduates, Dr. Paffenberger found that for every hour of exercise, life expectancy was increased by two hours. Isn't that incredible? One hour of exercise increases life expectancy two hours. 
that's a 200% in returns on my investment. That beats anything on Wall Street. <laughs> Absolutely. What's another step? Another step is uh, to prevent heart disease is eat a heart healthy diet. This diet is high in fiber and lots more. Current preventive cardiology research confirms that the best heart healthy diet is a well balanced plant based diet. L use lots of fruits and, and veggies. Uh, you know, foods like beans and lentils, when you eat them, it's like you're eating nitroglycerin. They help to open up the arteries. That's nature's nitroglycerin. When you eat foods like uh, broccoli and cabbage, they help to lower the cholesterol in the liver. For those who eat fish, you can get omega-3 in salmon and mackerel, and many people feel that omega-3 can be of great help to the heart. But if you're on a plant-based diet, be not alarmed because the omega-3 precursors can be found in flax seeds, walnuts, soybeans, and in my favorite, chia seeds. Okay, we have time for just one more strategy. What would that be? Here's the third one, and lower your stress. When someone is under stress, you have a release of adrenaline and cortisol. This rush of hormones can increase your heart rate, raise your blood pressure. Uh, in an emergency, this is helpful, but if this is continually happening day in, day out, it becomes harmful. A constant state of stress can make it very hard on the heart, so take steps to manage your stress. Thank you, Dr. Parma. Three wonderful steps. We want to take them in order that we might prevent a heart attack. Welcome to this episode of Healthy and Happy. I am Raven Martinborough. Our topic for today, stress can kill you. What can you do? Dr. Carleen Sinclair is our presenter. According to a CNN report, the day of the week when people have the most heart attacks is Monday. So why Monday? probably the stress of going back to work after the relaxation of the weekend, probably the stress of traffic, or of meeting that boss again. So, Dr. Sinclair, tell us what is stress and how, how does it operate? Well, stress is the body's response to emergency. It's the response to the demands that life place on us. They're called stressors. Okay. They're actually good stressors and bad stressors. Okay. For our protection, our brain is hardwired with an alarm system. Whenever a threat is perceived, the body sends out a signal, mm -hmm. and it releases a burst of hormones and cortisol and adrenaline. The heart pounds faster. The muscles tighten. The breathing is heavier. And the senses also get sharper. Okay. When the threat disappears, the body just relaxes and returns to its original state. We need stress so that we can manage emergencies. But if we have repeated periods of stress, this can be harmful. It can cause heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, autoimmune disease, ulcers, and even cancer. And one of our biggest problems in America is obesity and stress and the repeated release of cortisol can lead to obesity. Well, that's an awful list. Uh, so what can we do to manage the stress? Can you give us some strategies? First thing is whole body therapy. What do you mean by that? You have to empower your whole body to withstand the stress. This includes a nutritious diet, exercise, sleep, avoiding alcohol, and caffeine, as well as refined sugars and other refined products. Well, I think most people could do that if we try. What's your second strategy? Engage in relaxing activities. Take a walk outside, or even just down to the water cooler. Do fun things. Listen to some music, watch a comedy, work in the garden, and practice deep breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, that increases your oxygen supply. Well, most people do not breathe deeply, breathe shallow breathing. Can you demonstrate that for us? 
Okay, well, I'm going to do the shallow breathing first. People breathe like this. You take a deep breath. Now, this is the way to do it. In through your nose, out through your mouth, and you notice your abdomen pushes down because you need your diaphragm. It is the biggest muscle for breathing, not your ribs, as people think. All right. <laughs> That's important. Let's go to strategy number three. Make a plan to manage your day. There are always going to be areas that you have no control of. Do not try to control them. Instead, concentrate on the things that you can control. Okay. For example, at the start of the day, if you write up a to-do list, then you can prioritize. Try to do the heavier things first when your mind and body are fresh. And then start out for appointments early. Don't try to be on time. Try to be early. This helps keep you from avoiding losing control. Great, great. Tell us about a fourth strategy. Cognitive reconstructing. Big words. What does that mean? Change the way you think and talk to yourself, from negative to positive. Your amazing brain, it has a, over 100 billion cells, so your mind is very powerful. And the way you think about stress and the way you react to stress is one of the things that can cause you to manage stress properly or not manage it properly. Can you give us an example? Okay, 9 a.m., Martha's boss gives her the day's assignment. The last thing he has is the board's agenda. But by 10 o'clock, he's running into the office shouting, the board is ready to convene. Where's the agenda, Miss Lazy? If Martha uses negative self-talk, what can she tell herself? Oh, she can say, well, he's getting ready to fire me. If I lose my job, then I wouldn't be able to pay my mortgage. And and she keeps going on and on. Her stress level is rising, and so is her blood pressure. Yes, but if she tries positive self-talk, what are some of the things that she can tell herself? She could tell herself, no matter what he said, I am not Miss Lazy. I did not know that he wanted the agenda that early. Next, tomorrow, when he gives the list, I'll say, sir, uh, what would you like me to work on first? Okay. So when you face a stressor, think and talk positively. Our final technique for managing stress is spiritual meditation. More and more medical science is realizing that meditation is good for physical as well as mental health. Okay. The goal of meditation is to move the mind from the stressor to a supernatural power that is stronger. Are there different types of meditation? Yes. There's humanistic meditation, which says that this power lies within ourselves. And then there's spiritual meditation, which says that this power is God. Divine meditation is of God. I start each day with prayer and studying of the scriptures. And as I meditate on the scriptures, I get power to start my day. Awesome. Uh, and if it works for you, then it probably can work for all of us as well. Thank you, Dr. Sinclair, for sharing these strategies with us. We want to put them into practice so that our stress level will be lowered and we can live happy, healthy lives. Welcome to this episode of Healthy and Happy. I am Raveni Martinborough, and our topic, how to fight the big C with the big P. Dr. Palmer is our presenter. Cancer is so dreaded that some people are afraid to even call its name. They refer to it as C. So, Dr. Palmer, uh, how does cancer operate? Cancer is the uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells in the body. Your body has, according to the Smithsonian, around 37 trillion cells, uh, of which there are over 200 different types. And according to some estimates, uh, every day we have around 200 cells that go astray. 
And so when the cells die, new cells replace them. And when they get replaced, sometimes they become abnormal and then they start growing. They form clumps or tumors. Sometimes these tumors can spread to other parts of the body in metastasis. And this uh, leads to the dreaded C word. And, and uh, for many, unfortunately, death. There are at least 100 different types of cancers. A hundred different types. So what are the most frequent? The number one cancer is lung cancer. From men, uh, then we are talking, uh, we have lung cancer, and then we have prostate and colon cancer. For women, we are looking at breast, lung, and colon cancer. Some cancers are genetic, uh, but up to 70 to 80% of cancers, we believe, could be prevented. Now, if over 70% could be prevented, what can we do to prevent it? There are s seven things that we could do, uh, very easy steps. Number one is, if you're using alcohol or tobacco, stop. Tobacco smoke is responsible for one in every three cancer deaths. Tobacco has over 3,700 chemicals, of which we know 33 carcinogens, or cancer-causing agents. These damage the cell's DNA, that helps the multiplication. Uh, tobacco causes cancer of the lungs, the larynx, the pancreas, and many other organs. So if you smoke, please stop smoking. Heavy alcohol use is also associated with cancer, cancer of the mouth, the larynx, the esophagus, the liver. And alcohol is responsible for 12% of cancer deaths. So we need to break up with alcohol. You know, there are a lot of people who know that smoking is bad, but they have a hard time quitting. Um, can you give some tips how to quit? <laughs> yes, gladly. First, find a convincing reason to quit and keep that reason before you. Second, avoid the triggers. These are the people, the places, the objects that connect you with smoking. Third, you're going to go through withdrawal symptoms <laughs> unless you are very blessed. And so <laughs> if, uh, prepare for it and tell others around you you're going to be miserable for a few days, but let, they will live with you. Fourth, use distraction techniques. You know, chew gum, suck mint, uh, munch on celery. Fifth, drink lots of water. This flushes out the, the, the poison and it cools the craving. Uh, and sixth, use a support system. It's nice if you could find a partner or a buddy or join a support group that would help. And finally, and perhaps most important, enlist God's help. He is powerful, so pray for his help. Okay, so step number one, quit smoking and drinking. What's step number two? Number two is <laughs> avoid eating meat. <laughs> 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 That's that's a difficult thing for most people to do. But first of all, how does meat contribute to cancer? In several ways. Um, a lot of research have, has, uh, has been very conclusive on the subject. Food with fiber, uh, that's the food that grows from the ground. Meat has no fiber. It doesn't grow. It, yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. So food with fiber, it, when you're eating a high fiber diet, the food takes just a day to a day and a half to get into your system and out of it. Okay. But the digestion of meat takes from three to five days. And this slows because there's not enough fiber. The, the movement of meat through the digestive tract is slower. And this permits fermentation in the intestines and buildup. And this contributes to colon cancer. In addition, the high fat content of meat increases hormone production which adds to the risk of hormone-related cancers like breast cancer and prostate cancer. And we now know that the protein from meat itself is very, uh, would I say, carcinogenic. Wow. But we say we eat meat because of the protein. <laughs> but that's really not the type of protein that is helpful. It has been proven that the protein you find in animal products does not help to prevent cancer. Okay, there must be one more because 
our topic is how to fight the big C with the big P. So um, tell us about the big P. The big P is a word called phytochemicals. What's that? It doesn't even sound like a P, does it? <laughs> <laughs> phytochemicals. Oh, this, this is, we could go on and on for this, this subject. This is where I get really, really excited. Uh, phytochemicals are chemicals that the good Lord put in the food that comes out of the ground. Okay. These phytochemicals are chemotherapy medicines, natural chemotherapy medicines. Wow. <laughs> you find them only in plants, and the evidence uh, for each phytochemical is overwhelming. We know now which foods have them and what the phytochemicals are and how they help to prevent cancer. Somewhere I've read that the phytochemicals are color-coded. Is that true? Kind of. <laughs> it's an easy way to remember. For example, uh, uh, green vegetables have uh, certain phytochemicals such as lutein and indoles. And, and uh, can you name some of the greens? Oh, like colored greens and kale and spinach, broccoli. Brussels sprouts. In fact, uh, people who eat a lot of cruciferous vegetables like, uh, like broccoli, cabbage, uh, their risk of colon cancer and breast cancer, the, the solid tumor cancers, go way down. If, okay. if folks had started to smoke cabbage instead of tobacco, <laughs> we wouldn't have this issue. Okay, let's take one more color. The reds have such phytochemicals as lycopenes and the anthocyanins. Can you name a few of okay. the reds? Tomatoes, red peppers, strawberries, red apples. Right. Yes, and then there are the yellows, and they have the flavonoids. And oranges, lemons. And the list goes on and on. To put it differently, you can have a rainbow diet that can help us to beat cancer. Well, Dr. Palmer, these have been three very powerful steps that we could take, and we want to be able to fight cancer and win. Welcome to this episode of Healthy and Happy. I am Waverly Martinboro, and our topic for today, get peaceful sleep without sleeping pills. Dr. Carleen Sinclair is our presenter. When his friend Lazarus got sick and died, Jesus said, our friend Lazarus sleeps. And the disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. So why did they say that? Because sleep is the body's repair station. So, Doc, why do we need sleep? What are its benefits? Sleep facilitates the release of growth hormones. It strengthens our immune system. Sleep allows the body to renew its energy, and it extends life. It increases our brain function and improves our memory and concentration. Adequate sleep keeps us alert so we can make good decisions. Okay, but there are a lot of people who don't get enough sleep. So what are the dangers of insufficient sleep? First, let me say you cannot make up sleep. People think that they can. You cannot do that. When we don't get the amount of sleep that we need, we tend to eat more. The more we eat, the more weight that we gain. More weight increases the risk of hypertension and diabetes. In addition, sleep deficiency makes us drowsy. So we use caffeine and other products to stay alert. However, caffeine gives us a high and a low, kind of like a roller coaster. And we tend to get addicted. And something else, lack of sleep results in fatigue. Did you know that lack of sleep causes as many deaths as people who drink alcohol and drive? Is that so? Yes, it is. Uh, because people have a hard time getting enough sleep, uh, sleeping pills is a big business. How can we get a good night's sleep without sleeping pills? Okay, there's some things that we can do. First, try to establish the going to sleep the same time each night. Okay. Our body has a biological clock, and when that is frequently interrupted, you do not get this nice, sound sleep that you need. Second, 
do aerobic exercises during the day. Exercise helps release stress and anxiety by releasing endorphins. It also helps the body be more conducive to a sound sleep because it's tired and it will need its rest. Avoid exercise just before bedtime though. That's not good, you need to do it in the day. Third, shut out all the light. Make the rooms dark, use heavy curtains and drapes to keep the room dark and comfortable. Fourth, eat dinner at least three to four hours before going to sleep. Three to four hours? Yes. Why? Because, because many, many, many people don't eat their heavy meal in the evening. Yes. Why do we need to take it earlier? We need that three to four hours for the stomach to digest the food. So when we go to sleep, we have an empty stomach. And so the body can really rest, the whole body can really rest while you sleep. This also helps in weight control because you tend to burn up those calories before you go to sleep. Okay. Now number five is revolutionary. What's that? No electronics in the bedroom. <laughs> No computers, and no computers, iPads and no television. iPads, television, nothing in the bedroom. Because the bedroom is made for sleeping. And when we watch exciting shows, even the news, our brain is very excited and it takes a toll on us. So when we try to go to sleep, we're thinking about everything we read or watched <laughs> and we cannot get to sleep. Another thing that we can do, no alcohol or caffeine before we go to bed. Caffeine is a stimulant and alcohol is a depressant. Both of them prevent us from getting a good nice sleep. And finally, take a nice relaxing bath before bedtime. Listen to some relaxing music can also help. Okay, those are excellent strategies. Uh, do people ever need medication? Oh yes. We do have some people with medical problems such as sleep apnea, phobias, respiratory and psychiatric disorders, and they need professional care. They need to see a physician and be under the care of a physician. All right, another question. Uh, sometimes people can't sleep because of worry, worrying over challenges, uh, tomorrows. Uh, what can we do to, to treat the mind, not just the body with the strategies you already mentioned, the mind? Okay, so first, as you review your day, do not dwell on what was wrong. Instead, look at what went well throughout the day. Do not focus on the thorns, smell and absorb the roses. As the wise man says, a merry, cheerful heart does good like medicine. Yes, it does. Be grateful. Gratitude helps in sleep. And that reminds me of what the psalmist says. So give thanks to the Lord for his good. Yes. And third, don't worry about tomorrow. Worrying does not change things. It doesn't make them better. It doesn't make it worse. Put it all in God's hand. Let him take care of it. That reminds me of what Jesus said. Matthew 6, don't worry. Don't worry about tomorrow. Yes. Thank you for sharing these excellent strategies. We want to put them into practice so that we can have good rest, excellent sleep, be ready for each day, and live healthily and happily. Welcome to this episode of Healthy and Happy. I'm Waveney Martinborough. And our topic for today is beat high blood pressure. It's like David and Goliath. Our presenter, Dr. George Guthrie. So there they stood. Goliath, a fully armored giant, almost nine feet tall. A little boy named David. But wonder of wonders, the boy killed the giant. You know, today high blood pressure looms over us like Goliath, mm -hmm. a giant. Mm -hmm. And he keeps taunting us over and over again. But the good news is that he can be conquered. So first of all, Doc, tell us what is hypertension? That's an interesting uh, correlation, the, the giant kind of after us. Uh, well, uh, hypertension is 
high blood pressure, uh, that is the pressure that the heart has to push against, the blood, of course, against the blood vessels. When the blood pressure cuff is put on, the uh, pressure is on the arm as the pressure is let off where the blood first squirts through is a measure of the heart's hardest pressure. And then when the sound goes away of the blood squirting through, that's considered to be the resting pressure. Normal is uh, less than uh, 140 over 90, although the lower, the better. There's not a cut point that says everything above that is bad and everything below it is good. I heard it's called the silent killer. It Why is silent? the silent killer because it, it, is, uh, it has real, really no symptoms until you're hit with the big one. It might be a stroke, it might be a heart attack. But the event happens quickly, uh, but the hypertension itself has very few symptoms. Okay, so what causes it? Well, the causes are many, uh, but the most common kind of hypertension is called essential hypertension, which interestingly enough means essentially the doctors aren't sure. <laughs> of course, as time has gone on, science has begun to help us with that, and we now understand that it has something to do with inflammation in the blood vessels. The blood vessels use, lose their ability to relax, and mm -hmm. they're, so they're a little bit smaller, and there's more water in the pipes, so the pressure goes up. Okay. Now in our story of David and Goliath, uh, David slew the giant with a sling mm -hmm. and a stone. Mm -hmm. Of course, he gathered five stones. That's true. Uh, so can you share with us a few stones? Some that we stones can use? to slay this giant hypertension. Well, the first one I would choose would be uh, diet. It's what you eat. Okay. You can actually help to slay this giant by, by uh, eating foods that are high in fiber, high in water, and low in fat. Uh, those particular foods help to lower the blood pressure. Even beans, for example, uh, help to lower the blood pressure, as do fruits and vegetables and, and other such things. One of the things that we think is, is in play here is something called potassium. You've probably heard of potassium. When potassium goes up, our blood pressure is helped to come down. It's not the direct cause, but it's one of those things that can make a difference. Now, what foods have a lot of potassium in them? I'll bet you would say bananas. bananas. Beans have about three times as much. Wow. I like to say we're human beans. We should eat <laughs> plenty of these. Okay. Another thing we can do is to decrease the sugar in our diet because okay. sugar in the blood tends to increase inflammation, especially when it's up for a long time. Another thing we can do is decrease the red meat. Red meat has a lot of saturated fat in it. Saturated fat tends to make the blood vessels a little bit stiffer and mm -hmm. makes the blood pressure go up. If one is going to use dairy products, better to use the low-fat kind just okay. to get rid of the saturated fat. And, and I suppose the last thing on our diet list would be to be careful not to overeat. Be careful of what you put on your plate. You don't want the serving size to be too much. Just using a smaller plate can make a difference. So there you go, stone one. Okay, stone one diet. Mm -hmm. What about stone two? Stone two is exercise. Okay. okay? Uh, exercise uh, helps to lower the blood pressure for probably a variety of reasons. And it's, uh, the best exercise is the moderate kind. When you first start to exercise, your blood pressure goes up just a little bit. And as you exercise enough, your, the uh, blood vessels and your muscles open up and the blood pressure will drop down. If you keep exercising and exercise really hard, it'll go back up. But that moderate <laughs> exercise is the best place. And the neat thing about exercise is it's not as uh, how hard you exercise that brings your blood pressure down. It's actually how long you exercise. Okay. So if in the morning, for example, I were to run for 15 minutes or walk for 15 minutes, the blood pressure lowering effect would be the same through the day. So that's good news, too. You don't sure. have to kill yourself sure. trying to get that <laughs> blood pressure down doing your exercise. Just something moderate can make a difference. Okay. I think we have time for one more stone. Okay. What would that be? Well, the third stone, let's call it stress management. Okay? Uh, when we're nervous and uptight, it tends to make the uh, nerves that go to the blood vessels constrict them more. So if we can have calmness in our hearts, that okay. can help. One of the things that can be beneficial is something that's called meditation. Now, worldly meditation usually uh, 
focuses on finding the strength within. I find it much more helpful to uh, look at the uh, love of my Heavenly Father for me. As I look to Him, I can have calmness and peace in my heart. Thankfulness, by the way, is one of those things that is strongest in helping us to uh, keep that stress and that blood pressure under control. Meditation. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't want to mix that up with medication. Oh, what, right, what, right, right. What about medication? There is a place for medication. Uh, hypertension is the silent killer, and even though you can't feel anything, it needs to be brought down. And we have medications that can control it. They don't necessarily deal with the underlying cause, but they will help while you work on the, getting the three stones right where they belong. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. So diet, exercise, lowering one, managing one's stress. Mm -hmm. If we use those stones, we can probably slay our giant and keep Absolutely. hypertension under control. <laughs> Good. Welcome to this episode of Healthy and Happy. I am Raven Martinborough. And today our topic is drink more water and climb Mount Everest. Our presenter, Dr. Carleen Sinclair. In 1952, the Swiss team, believed at that time to be the best in the world, tried to climb Mount Everest and failed. When the British examined they discovered something very important. The Swiss had been drinking just two glasses of water per day. So the British team decided they will drink 12 glasses. And the rest is history. On May 29, 1953, Edmund Hillary and Tenzel Norgay became the first humans to reach the summit. What was their secret? They just drank more water. So, Doc, why is water so important to us, to our health and to our performance? Well, about 70% of our body is made up of water. It makes up 80% of the blood and 85% of our brains. Even the bones are 15% water. Every cell in our body requires water to function. It allows the food we eat to become water soluble and after the nutrients have been digested, it takes the blood, which is mostly water, to transport it to the different organs in the body. Okay. Again, the blood transports the oxygen from our lungs everywhere in our body to each and every cell. So, Dr. Sinclair, you're saying that the first important function is that it's a transportation system for nutrients as well as oxygen. Yes, it is. Is there a second uh, reason? Oh, yes. Water is also the body's disposal agent. It transports the body's impurities for disposal. It transports them to the kidneys, and it facilitates the removal of waste products even through perspiration. It also helps us get rid of stuff through our bowels and feces. Okay. So... Since water cleanses the system from its impurities, someone said it's like trying, if we drink insufficient water, it is like trying to wash a sink of dirty dishes with a cup of water. That's true. <laughs> Tell us about the third function. Well, it can help combat illness. Water combats constipation. Since it removes the toxins that are harmful to the body, through the feces without having them stay in there for a long time. Constipation is associated with colon cancer. So drinking enough water allows us to have normal, healthy bowel movements and helps prevent toxin can, from building up in our body. So it, you're saying that water can lessen the incidence of cancer, colon it, cancer? Yes, it can. Also bladder cancer. Okay. Because drinking enough water, again, allows you to empty your system. Okay. Okay. And another import important thing that it does with the kidneys is kidney stones. It's a very, very painful condition. And drinking enough water can decrease the formation of these stones. It also helps with our joints 
by lubricating our joints to help prevent joint pain. It also helps prevent and decrease obesity because when we drink more, we eat we less. We eat less, okay. Yes. And we take in less calories. If we eat foods that have a lot of water, like some fruits, we're full. And so we end up eating less calories, and therefore it avoids obesity. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, how much water do we need to drink? About six to eight eight ounce glasses a day. Those with a bigger body mass will need to drink more. If you're exercising vigorously, especially out in the sun, you will need to drink more. Illnesses, fevers, vomiting, diarrhea, you need to replace that water in addition to the normal water intake. And here's another guide. Look at the color of your urine. If you're not getting enough water, your urine will be darker. If you are getting enough water, you should have clear urine at least once a day. All right. Now tell us about soda. Is that, that has water. Is that a substitute? Ah, no, 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 no. <laughs> no sodas. Sodas also have a lot of sugar. And some of them have caffeine, which can be a diuretic. Each can of soda has between 8 and 12 teaspoons of sugar. Okay. So if you drink two cans of soda a day, that's over 600 cans per year. That's over 6,000 teaspoons of sugar wow. a year. Coffee is also harmful because it's a diuretic and it can rid the body of the water that it needs. Plus, it's addictive. Now, one, one more concept. Uh, for those guys to have reached the top of Everest, they had to have a water strategy. So if we are to experience the Everest of our health, we also need a strategy to get that, those six to eight glasses. <laughs> can you give us some ideas uh, well, how we can create such a strategy? Absolutely. When you wake up, try to drink one or two glasses very early in the day. Keep water handy so that you can drink it at regular intervals. Measure a daily supply of water. Keep it with you and try to drink it and finish it throughout the day. Try to finish it by early evening because if you drink too much water too late in the evening, you'll end up waking up and interrupting your sleep, which is very important. And lastly, do not wait to feel thirsty. When you're thirsty, your need for water is long overdue. So try to drink enough so that you do not have that hard okay. thirst feeling. That's a lot of information, valuable information. Thanks for these strategies so that we can drink more water, climb the Everest of our health, and live healthy and happy. Welcome to this episode of Healthy and Happy. I am Raven Martinborough, and our topic today Addictions are like demons, how to conquer them. Our presenter, Dr. Schubert Palmer. Today, many young people, and some older ones as well, are struggling with various challenges. Low income, low self-esteem, unemployment, poverty, and a variety of other challenges. And uh, in order to combat them, they are trying to get some exciting activities. But the fact is that later on, they realize that their helpers have become demons. Dr. Palmer, you know that when they try to break free from some of these habits, they recognize that they have become addicted. Mm -hmm. So. First of all, can you name some of the demons that these folk try in order to cope with the challenges of life? Sure. First, there's tobacco. No question, it aids relaxation. It causes kids to look mature, but it damages the heart. It causes lung cancer and many others. It kills 1,200 persons every day in the United States. Wow. Another uh, is marijuana, legal or not. It does help to make you feel happy, relaxed, detached from reality, 
but it can cause dizziness, drowsiness, unclear thinking, and for heavy marijuana users, it can shrink your brains. The third one is alcohol. This removes us from reality, and it lessens tensions and makes us feel good, but it damages the brain cells, the liver cells, the heart, causes accidents and death. Then there is cocaine and methamphetamines. It, these elevate the mood, give a sense of energy, alertness, but it can cause a heart attack, uh, sudden death, and a host of other problems. And then the one that's uh, most popular today, probably, prescription drugs, yes. pain, pain uh, medicines. Starts harmlessly to escape pain, but gradually you get addicted, and now we're having an opioid crisis. People are dying from drug overdose. So the big question is, uh, what can we do to combat these demons? What strategies can we put in place to get over <laughs> our addictions? First, you have to admit you have a problem and yes. then make up your mind to quit. Make a firm decision to beat it. So first, it has to start with the mind. Make up the mind. What's next? Uh, then uh, identify the triggers and, uh, and avoid what them. What are triggers? The triggers are, are, are any person or thing or place that, that creates a desire for, for the behavior. So stay away from the trigger buddies and from the trigger venues. Wash your clothes to remove the scents if you have to, and use a, a freshener. Now, I've heard that one of the big challenges is withdrawal symptoms. Tell us something about that. All of these substances are addictive. So withdrawing are going to produce strong cravings. Some withdrawal symptoms are things like irritability, nervousness, difficulty concentrating, headaches, fatigue, back pains, tremors, upset stomach, constipation, uh, even diarrhea and, and increased appetite. Uh, withdrawal symptoms can last for days, even weeks. For a person who has, uh, say, withdrawing from tobacco, five days usually takes to get the chemical addiction out of your system. So expect withdrawals and be prepared for them. Be prepared for them. How can we prepare for them? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, one effective strategy is use distraction techniques. Uh, distraction is anything you do temporarily to take your attention off of the strong urge. If you focus on the strong desire, it will get even stronger. But if you can distract yourself, the urge will get weaker. Okay. And some distraction techniques practically? Okay. For example, uh, for a person who smokes, they're accustomed to having things in their, mouth, so in their mouth. So put something in your mouth like a mint or a gum, a carrot or a celery. Okay. Um, do something with your hands. Some people like to just <laughs> for smoking. So put a ball that you can squeeze or, or hold a pencil or brush your teeth. Take a shower, a cold shower <laughs> would work marvels. Now, here's another one. Call a friend or a family to just talk okay. or someone who is going through this or who has been through this that could, could, could help you through. Someone suggests you could count backwards from 50 to 1, and then if it's still there, keep going on to minus. Uh, deep breathing, just breathe slowly, and, 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 or play a fun game or a challenging game that requires concentration. Okay. Question. Can a person do this all alone, or do we need help? In severe cases, we need to get the services of a professional Christian therapist. Cognitive behavior therapy does help uh, help one discover the reasons for their behavior, and thus it enables the person to develop coping skills. But more than that, much more than that, it's important that we get divine help. Yes. The devil delights to destroy. So overcoming any harmful habit is not just physical warfare, but it is spiritual warfare. Therefore, we need to enlist a power that is greater than the devil's. Yes. We can have access to God's power through prayer and the study of his scripture. And we can claim the promises, God's precious promises, like Philippians 4.13, I can do all, all things. things through Christ who strengthens me. Awesome. Practical steps you have given us. And we appreciate these very much. It tells us that we can beat addictions. Our commitment, help, and above all, God's help. Thank you so much for sharing with us.
welcome to this episode of Healthy and Happy. I am Wavy Martin Burrow, and our topic is Get Lasting Weight Control. You can do it. Our presenter, Dr. George Guthrie. Nicholas Vyuchich was born to Australian parents. He came without arms and without legs. But he finished college, got married, has two children, and is a great motivational speaker. His bestseller, entitled Life Without Limbs, has been translated into 30 different languages. You know, Doc, Nick tells us that we can overcome any challenge. That's amazing. And today, one of our biggest challenges is weight control. Mm -hmm. We are told that two out of every three Americans are overweight. Mm. One out of every three is obese. And uh, there are many who have tried this and tried that and have given up. They've, they've, they've failed. And but Nick has assured us that every challenge can be overcome. Mm -hmm. So can you give us the magic formula for weight control? Well, the magic formula doesn't take an Einstein to figure out. <laughs> uh, we measure energy in and energy out by looking at calories. So our weight tends to go up when we have more calories in than we use up. So if we decrease the calories that we are taking in and increase the calories that we're burning, the weight will come down. Okay. So we're talking of increasing and decreasing. Okay. Uh, so, key number one sounds like it has to do with controlling the number of calories that I take in. Tell right. us a little more, more about, about that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, controlling calories is a little bit problem. You could starve yourself, <laughs> but generally people don't tolerate that very well. So it makes sense to eat foods that are uh, lower in calories and high in nutritional density. And those uh, end up being, uh, believe it or not, the fruits and vegetables and whole grains. Their caloric density is less, so you can eat more, fill yourself up without getting so many calories. So that's probably the, the first and most important, but we could add other to that. For example, one can eat smaller servings. Now just a smaller plate, believe it or not, can actually make a difference in how much we eat. If the small plate is full, we sense that we've eaten more than if it was the same food was on a larger plate. Uh, another thing we can do is avoid empty calories. Have you heard What's, this term? Yes. What, tell, tell us more empty about empty calories. Empty calories means calories without a lot of nutrients with them. It's, in, in essence, highly refined foods. So, uh, like... For example? Well, uh, do nots. <laughs> <laughs> I think do nots are named that way for a reason, right? I mean, it's highly refined flour with a lot of nutrients taken out. We have to put uh, kind of nutrients back into the refined flour, a lot of sugar, a lot of fat, and those are concentrated calories that go uh, down quickly. Another uh, kind of corollary to that is avoid fast foods. The, the yes. stuff that you generally yes. pick up at the fast food stores uh, will tend to be very high in fat and grease, and, and it's made to kind of get a lot of calories in quickly. Now, one of my favorite things to talk about is when you eat, which, okay. which is a little more, uh, let's say, uh, uh, complicated or a little different. If you are eating a bunch of calories just before you go to bed, mm -hmm. your body is more likely to, to put them into storage. If you eat them at the beginning of the day, they're more likely to be burned. I like to put it this way. If you were flying from here to Honolulu, would you rather they put the fuel in the plane here or after <laughs> you get to Honolulu? There's sense to taking it at the uh, early part of the day, and indeed that works better. Uh, another thing I suppose we could think about is the liquids, because liquids can really fool us. When we take uh, sweet, sugary drinks, whether it's uh, fruit juice or sodas, we tend to put in a lot of calories quickly. And if you really want to make it bad, put alcohol with that, because alcohol has calories in it, the liquid part has calories. Oh. At least in our fruit juices, there's no calories in the water part. So alcohol can really turn that up. I mean, much better to drink water. Okay, so that's the first part of the formula. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, tell us about the second part, the burn up So part. we need to burn it up by uh, the calories by being active. Um, being active, uh, especially people who are overweight, they're a little afraid of that. And it's very common for people to exercise a little too hard at first and actually hurt themselves. So a moderate exercise, start slow and then slowly kind of build up as, uh, as you, you get used to it. You know, if you exercise really hard, there's a buildup of lactic acid in the muscles and in the blood, and it decreases something in the brain called endorphins. You heard of these? Yes. I like to call them the feel-good They're, they're the feel-good hormone, that's right. Uh, I like to call them outdorphins because I think you get even better when you go outdoors to get this, this okay. exercise, okay? okay. okay. So the, uh, okay. The, when you exercise too hard, it decreases this, this pleasant hormone in your brain, and, and so you don't want to do it again. So moderate amounts of exercise done on a daily basis, maybe 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, I think would be a, a good like minimum, at least five days a week. And as we do this, we begin to increase our muscle mass. Now it's interesting, when your muscle mass gets bigger, even when you're sleeping at night, your body is burning more calories. It's increasing what we some? call the basal metabolic rate. Wow. Well, those are great tips. You know, uh, Nick tells us that what seems impossible can be done. Yes, yes. Uh, he uses thumbs to operate his wheelchair mm -hmm, and, and mm -hmm. his computer and his mobile mm -hmm, phone. Mm -hmm. And uh, if he could do it, then we could do it too. That's right. And you know, he didn't learn that quickly. He had to work on those skills bit by bit. A lot of people, when they lose weight, want to lose it quick. quickly. They have a crash diet, and the weight goes down, and then they gain it back up, and then they lose it, and then they gain it. I call that the rhythm method of girth control. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have time for just one more point. Okay. Uh, can we get any help from God on this? You know, I think God is the best place to find the source of that love. He certainly demonstrated that on Calvary. And when we think about that and read about his care for us as individuals, it can be a powerful force to overcome food addiction. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. okay. Welcome to this episode of Healthy and Happy. I am Waveney Martinborough, and our topic for today, are you a love bug or a love bird? Dr. Schubert Palmer is our presenter. When my wife and I lived in California in the 1970s, we owned a Volkswagen Bug. But that's not the bug we're talking about in this episode. We're talking about the love bug, which is a small flying insect, starts mating as soon as the females emerge, and they live for just a few days. On the other hand, there is the love bird. This is an affectionate parrot. It has a strong monogamous bond to its mate and lives for 10 to 15 years. So, Dr. Palmer, does a loving relationship have any, anything to do with good health? It surely does. Just like the lovebirds, we are created, we are created to love and, and to be loved. Do you know that if a baby is fed but it's never touched, it will die? And studies show that an intimate marriage increases health and lengthens life, and studies also show that simple cohabitation does not. Wow, that's important to know. <laughs> It's also interesting to realize that when God created the first couple, he designed them to live like love birds. He told them they should become one flesh, which is a term that refers to sexual intimacy. But today, each person has a choice. We can either live like a love bug and have sex with anybody, or we can live like a love bird and have a committed relationship to my husband or wife only. Mm -hmm. So tell us, Doc, 
uh, what are some of the dangers of living like a love bug? Lots of dangers. Unwanted pregnancy is one. Feelings of guilt. A vicious cycle of promiscuity and, and uh, infection with sexually transmitted diseases such as AIDS. And AIDS has already killed 30 million people and continues to kill 1.8 million people every year. Although it's no longer in the headlines, over 36 million people are living with HIV AIDS worldwide and more than 1.1 million of them are in the United States alone. So what's the difference between HIV and AIDS? Okay, well, HIV stands for Human Immune Deficiency Virus, or Human Immunodeficiency Virus. It, this is a virus that destroys the white blood cells and weakens the immune system, hence its name. If left untreated, it will develop into AIDS. AIDS is an acronym for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. So HIV is the starting point, and AIDS, you could say, is the end result. In its early stages, the infected person may show symptoms such as diarrhea, swollen lymph glands, genital sores, dark patches, and um, sometimes a prolonged cough. But after a few days or weeks, the symptoms can disappear. And for the next 10 years or more, the infected person may have no symptoms. And, uh, but during that time, the virus is silently doing its deadly work. So, during that period, the virus can be transmitted from person to person and without either person knowing it. Now, that's a scary thought, that the transmission could occur without someone knowing it. Therefore, we have to be careful in the way we live. Uh, how does it spread from one person to another? Several ways. Uh, one common way uh, is contaminated needles, syringes, or, or sharp instruments or from mother to baby during pregnancy, or childbirth, or breastfeeding, or, or by the transfusion of contaminated blood. But the most common way is by having unprotected vaginal, anal, or oral sex with an infected person. So what can we do to prevent its spread? Number one, get tested. And if you are infected, get treated. There is quality treatment that can prolong life. However, the bigger solution is prevention. You prevention know, the, is better than cure. It's still <laughs> true. The most effective way is avoiding casual sex and refraining from having multiple sexual partners. Maintain a sexual relationship within the marriage circle only and use caution. And if you're unsure of your partner's health, use a condom. So in other words, don't live like a love bug, mating with any and everybody. Live like a love bird. Confine your sex relationship to your husband or wife only. Thank you so much for these wonderful ideas. We don't want to be love bugs. We want to be love birds. Welcome to this episode of Healthy and Happy. I am Waveney Martin Burrow, and our topic, Enhance Your Brain Power, Fight Alzheimer's. Our presenter, Dr. George Guthrie. Once upon a time, two women went to court because they claimed the same baby. They appeared before the judge, King Solomon. And in his wisdom, he said, bring a sword, divide the baby. You take half, and the other one take half. One mother said, no, 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 let her have it. The other said, divide it. It will be neither hers nor mine. Solomon was able to say, that's the true mother. He did that because he had the great brain power. And so, Doc, every day we have to make decisions, and some of them, like, like it is in your field, mm -hmm. <laughs> need a lot of brain power. That's true. Uh, tell us a little more about the brain. Brain is amazing. There's so much stuff packed in there, so much computing power. It's, it's quite amazing. 100 billion cells, each of them with uh, 
anywhere from a thousand to hundreds of thousands of connections, each interacting in ways that we're still trying to understand. It is an amazing organ. Yes, and uh, when we look at it, we are reminded of what David says, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We really are, yeah. So our challenge is to care for the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we'd like to spend the time on, the different ways that we can care for our brain so okay. that we can ha we may not get to so Solomon's brain power, mm -hmm. but uh, tell us one step that we could take. Well, one of the things that's really uh, good for strength, and probably the strongest for strengthening at least the number of brain cells, is uh, physical exercise. There's a little hormone that's released that helps the brain build new brain cells and connections. That tends to happen in uh, something we call the hippocampus, kind of down low. It's where memory is, uh, kind of starts and is managed from there. So those new cells can be made. That's, that's encouraging. That we can get new brain cells. We used to think that we had a set when we started and we <laughs> used them up and lost them. <laughs> Is this true? I'm told that this hippocampus, that that is one of the first areas that is, comes experience damage uh, with patients with Alzheimer's? With uh, Alzheimer's and uh, type of dementia, there is a shrinking. It can actually be seen on imaging of the hippocampus. That's correct. So uh, physical exercise can help to delay the onset of Alzheimer's? One of the best things you can do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So physical activity. What's number two? Well, the, next, the second one I would put on here is nutrition. And th there are several things that become prominent in our understanding of how nutrition affects the brain. One of those is in serotonin. Maybe you've heard of this as the happy hormone. The yes. antidepressant medicines tend to increase the amount of serotonin in the brain. Serotonin is made from an amino acid called tryptophan, which needs to go into the brain and then get changed into uh, the uh, serotonin. So it's good if our foods have plenty of tryptophan. this tryptophan. Okay. Uh, it, because the tryptophan has to compete with other amino acids or protein building blocks, it's important to have uh, foods that have a high amount of tryptophan compared to others. And the best. What are some examples? Well, the best foods end up being the beans. And if I remember correctly from uh, what I've read, the uh, black eyed peas are some of the very best. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Now, another one of the things that's helpful for the brain is uh, the omega-3 oils. And you've probably heard of those and things yes. like walnuts and flaxseed and uh, even uh, fish. Okay. Do we have another activity? Well, <coughs> uh, brain activity can be helpful. You can put your brain to work learning new things. Okay. So that could be... Uh, playing games, that could be word games or something like Sudoku, or you can even uh, teach yourself a new skill, you know, brush your teeth with the opposite hand, <laughs> and your brain <laughs> has, to, has to learn something, right? It doesn't have to all be kind of head memory learning uh, textbook type work, it can okay. actually be just turn it, teaching yourself something physically. Like uh, playing a new instrument, sure. learning a new sure. language. That's exactly right. As a matter of fact, when I turned 55, I said I'm going to learn the guitar. It's part of my <laughs> Alzheimer's <laughs> prevention program. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me, some time ago I uh, met Dr. H.M.S. Richards Sr., mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who is the fungo, the voice of prophecy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. radio form. He was then in his 80s, mm -hmm. and he told us that he was then reading. He said, always read a difficult book. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm now reading the 1,200-page Bible dictionary. Wow. Now, whoever heard here of reading a dictionary? Mm -hmm. uh, that he, he That's the way he was doing it. Cognitive activity. Keep your brain active. I agree. Okay. Any other key? Next one is social connectedness. Okay. And, and having people who we interact with on a regular basis is, ends up being really important for our brain health. We are social creatures. Without that, there's loneliness and uh, shrinking in the brain. We need that interaction. Okay. Uh, does spirituality come into play? Is that a key? Well, uh, yes. Uh, as we think about kind of big things, eternal things, uh, especially if we can find rest and peace for the stress of, of uh, the stress hormones of life tend to wear on the brain. So as we can find that kind of peace and, and uh, calmness in our meditating on spiritual things, studying the Bible, as you mentioned, 
we uh, strengthen ourselves. And, uh, I, that's an excellent thing to do. So, Doctor, you have shared five keys with us. The physical activity, cognitive, mental mm -hmm. activity, nutritional mm -hmm. activity, the food we eat, social, mm -hmm. and the spiritual. Mm -hmm. And if we mm -hmm. do participate in these, then we can extend our life, extend our health, and increase our brain power. Sounds right to me. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Welcome to this episode of Healthy and Happy. I'm Waveney Martin Burrow, and our topic for today, how to beat depression, just like Elijah did. Our presenter, Dr. George Guthrie. Elijah was fearless. He stood on the top of Mount Carmel and called on fire from heaven. And then he ordered the execution of all the prophets of Baal. When Queen Jezebel heard that, she was furious and ordered his death. And believe it or not, the prophet ran away, sat under a tree, and prayed to die. It seems, Doc, that Elijah was experiencing depression. It does sound that way. And we are told that about 20% of adults in America are diagnosed with depression. And tragically, 3.4% of these victims commit suicide. Wow. So can you tell us what, what is depression? Uh, <clears throat> depression is a, a sense of persistent sadness, kind of loss of interest in things that, uh, that comes to many of us at times through our lives. It can be uh, divided into kind of a, a major de a depression or a situational depression. Okay. Situational depression usually comes when something bad happens, as ha which happened to Elijah. But there's also a depression that comes without cause. It's just a darkness that seems to uh, come on people's lives and they feel depressed. Okay. Uh, biologically, um, is there a cause? <laughs> That, that's hard to know for sure. We're still learning so much about the brain. When I was in medical school, I was taught that there's a chemical imbalance in the brain, but our modern imaging now tells us that there's not a chemical imbalance in the brain. We think now it has more to do with the circulation of blood through the frontal lobe. This is where we do so much of our thinking. thinking. Uh, and, and uh, inflammation may have something to do with that because inflammation would tend to decrease that blood flow. So it's my understanding that these two things come into play uh, with the, the cause of depression. So are there some strategies that we can take? The, the, the cause may be nebulous, but strategies should be certain. The uh, doctors generally, when they find someone who's depressed, very quickly bring out their prescription pad and uh, write for one of the antidepressant medications. Yeah. Unfortunately, these have not been as effective as we might uh, have expected them to be. For Certainly for severe depression, they can be helpful. Uh, there are, though, some lifestyle factors that, okay. that can come in and, and help us with that, and we have, we have learned uh, some of these things. Uh, one of those would be sleep. Uh, when people are depressed, they tend not to sleep as well. Uh, they, and if we can get them to sleep, then that can help the brain. You see, our brain does clean up and fix it work and deals with stress uh, while we're sleeping. So good sleep can help. Now, it's interesting to note that in the story with Elijah from mm -hmm. in 1 Kings 19, that sleep was a factor. The Bible says that he slept, mm -hmm. then he awoke, and then he slept again. <laughs> yes, he was definitely tired after running all that distance and, and working so hard climbing the mountain. So, uh, which is a good point, and we might add the next piece here yes. is exercise, because for some reason, exercise also helps us sleep. We could add sunlight to that as well, because sunlight helps the whole sleep process. So, just being active and outdoors may help the, uh, the sleep, as well as increase the blood flow to the frontal lobe, which helps depression, and moderate exercise since it decreased inflammation. So it's really dealing with the things that we now understand to be at least part of the cause of depression. Uh, Elijah did some exercise. He went on a 40-day walk. That's <laughs> true, that's true. Uh, tell us, does, does diet have anything to do? Diet can make a difference as well. 
Uh, a, um, and wh why would that be? Well, where, where if you take a high sugar or high fat diet, it tends to plug up the blood, small blood vessels. So it may actually decrease the circulation in the brain. So that's one aspect. Another part of it is uh, the whole business with serotonin. Okay. Sometimes the happy hormone, this is where the medications are supposed to be working to help. But uh, the building block for uh, serotonin is called tryptophan. So if we have foods that are high in tryptophan and don't have other things to compete with, like the tryptophan found in many of the beans, for example. Uh, black is that peas. what they call brain foods? Yeah, we could call it brain food. Uh, uh, tryptophan is helpful, especially when it comes in the right package. Another one that we consider would be the omega-3 fats, like from uh, fish or from uh, uh, walnuts or flaxseed. All of these tend to have the omega-3 oils, which can be beneficial to the brain. Well. God prescribed that for Elijah also. Angels came and provided a meal for him, uh -huh. and, and he ate it two times. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, any other strategy? Well, one of the things that can be hardest to deal with is what we'll identify here as stinking thinking. Okay? <laughs> we have this, uh, this uh, tendency when we're depressed to awfulize things. We say, you know, this bad thing happened, and it's awful, awful, awful and we focus on the awful. Yes. Uh, to put that back in perspective and say, wait a minute, the fact that my <coughs> uh, kid tried marijuana doesn't mean he's a total failure. You know, I made some mistakes when I was a kid too, okay. and let's give him a chance. Yeah. So, you know, this awfulizing everything, it's, it's the end of the world and my, my life is gonna end. Dealing with that kind of thinking can be very helpful. This is sometimes called cognitive behavioral therapy. Great, and God used that on Elijah. He sure he, did. He confronted them there. What, what, what are you doing here, Elijah? Talk, talk, talk to me. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's like, didn't. have you forgotten that I run this universe? What that's are you afraid right. of? That's right, that's right. Can you give us a final strategy? Well, uh, does, does God, God's cake, does the thought of God have anything to do with it? I think it's safe to say that uh, Understanding that God loves us can be extremely helpful when we are depressed. I know when I feel the depression coming over me, and I often turn to Psalms 23. Okay. Where it says, the Lord is my, my shepherd. shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And as I remind myself of God's care for me, it helps to push out the stinking thinking and to, to put my mind at peace and kind of improve my brain function. Thanks, Doc, for sharing these vital strategies. All of us at some time or another have to deal with depression. Mm -hmm. But if we use the strategies, we can overcome.